uh, this continues on from last week and and uh, you know from uh, uh, what I've said before or you know on your own or from Sunday school in the past or wherever that uh, good places to look for overviews of the book of Revelation are, are chapters 6 and chapter 12 and chapter 20 that kind of give a, a big picture of things and other chapters in Revelation are, are uh, uh, point out details from this overall structure. Uh, but we look at chapter uh, 12. Um, this is God's word, eternally true. Revelation 12, beginning in verse 1. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Here ends our reading. We have a response of thankfulness that's printed for us there in our bulletins. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. When you um, look at scripture, it's always good a good thing to ask the question, what does God want me to believe or know? What does God want me to, to do? Or what does God want me to feel? And uh, different parts of Scripture give you different parts of that. And so as uh, one who preaches God's Word, that's always what I'm asking, and that's what I was trained in doing. And I found over uh, 18 years now of, of uh, being ordained in pastoral ministry that... Um, uh, this is always something that's coming out of God's Word. And, and does God want me to know something here? Does He want me to feel? Is He instructing me in how I should feel? Is He instructing me in, in, in what I should do or what I should think, how I should act, what I should say? And uh, this, and uh, I was very much formed one time when I was next to a copier uh, at uh, seminary. I was copying some uh, papers from one of the professors there. And one of my other professors came in and another student, and they were in the midst of a conversation about preaching. And uh, this uh, professor, who was also very 
uh, influential with uh, Tim and Tim Inman in his life. The question was posed to him, and I was just getting to listen, God's sovereignty. Uh, do you believe all scripture is uh, exhortative? And that's a fancy way of saying, do you believe even things that are mundane or, or ordinary and just things to know, do they have necessary commands that come out of them? And, and, and the answer was yes. And I found that to be very true. It's what others have said and nothing brilliant on my part, but it's just in the practice of preaching, uh, I've seen that a lot of times God is just telling us to know something, but out of what we know, we act and we think and we feel. So just, you know, a little example here. If I believe this uh, glass, clear glass is water, I will have certain action toward that if I'm thirsty. But if I have the same degree of thirst and I'm convinced that that clear glass contains in it hydrochloric acid, a different piece of knowledge, a different belief, I will act and feel very differently about that clear glass full of liquid there. Uh, as we look at this passage, there's a lot of stuff of just know this. But yet there are a lot of commands that come out of this. Not a lot, just a few. The commands we'll get to next week. Um, this week we look at knowing. And, and what God wants to do, in, uh, uh, what he wanted to do when he inscripturated this in, in Revelation 12, is tell his church what to know about what to expect between the time when Jesus ascends to heaven and when he comes back. And what he does here in this passage is gives us the lay of the land. What will things be like? And John was doing this for people in A.D. 95. And it's the same message to us in A.D. 2018. What should I expect from life? What should I expect from people who aren't believers? People who are believers. Um, what should I expect from governments in the world during this time? And so today we look at lots of things for you, to, for you to know that have implications toward our action, toward our feeling, and that kind of thing. Next week in, 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 in full gear, we'll get toward some of those actions, what we should feel and think and that kind of thing. Uh, and, and this week we continue on with what we began last week of what we should know about our era. The era between Jesus sitting down at the right hand of the Father and his return. Okay. So uh, uh, to review as we go through here, we're just looking at each, each verse of the passage here and just making identifications. And we do this for you because if you go into a Christian bookstore, 90% of the books you can buy about the book of Revelation are telling you crazy, fanciful things that are often with this uh, 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 meaning that is uh, um, nuts. Sorry, couldn't think of another word. <laughs> Um, uh, and, and so uh, uh, the, the, um, the church has not taken those things in such a way through the centuries, and, and, uh, but in the last 150 years in the United States, well, the last 100 years in the United States, um, really a, a different view of these things has come along, and, and it, it essentially says these things didn't mean anything to anybody until our day today. And that's something you never want to do with Scripture. Okay. God, if God's message was only to people in 2018, he would inscripturate, write a new book of scripture in 2018. But God's people in AD 95 needed to hear something. They needed some clarification about things that were going on around them. And so God inscripturated then. He created scripture then. He created the book of Revelation then through the Apostle John and inspired these words. So in general, introduction there, just overall the book of Revelation for you to know. Revelation is a book that helps you to understand the great battle between Satan and Jesus from Jesus' birth and ascension, from Jesus' birth and ascension to his return. This book of Revelation is about. Um, and, and then there's a little bit about after his return in chapters 21 and 22. Uh, but the bulk of it is, is the former. Okay, so we continue on in our identifications of various things in, in Revelation 12. And so 
Here's what I want you to do. We've been through the first 12 verses, so I want you right now, look at your Bibles. Okay, look at, look at chapter 12, and I want your eyes just to follow along with these verses because we're going to blow through verses 1 through 12 because we talked about that uh, uh, extensively, semi-extensively yet last week, and then we'll, we'll look in part. So you won't have anything to fill out for 12 verses. So I just want your eyes to be on those 12 verses and to, to remind yourselves of what you heard last week or, or if you were out of town or sick last week uh, to get caught up. Verse 1, the woman is God's Old Testament, 12 tribe people, Israel. Uh, just as uh, they were referred to by Joseph in Joseph's dream in Genesis 37 that we read, uh, the, the uh, sun is, is Jacob or Israel, the moon is Rachel, and the 11 stars in Joseph's dream are his 11 brothers. But if you add Joseph to those 11 brothers, guess how many stars you have? 11 plus 1 equals... 12, and that's what we have here. This is the woman, okay? This is Israel, okay? God is not creating something new or fanciful here. All of a sudden, breaking into the, into the scriptural world in AD 95, creating something new. No, he's, he's talking about something that Moses wrote back in Genesis 37, something that Joseph knew, okay? This is Israel. Verse 2, Israel by Mary gives birth to Jesus, okay? Gee, who would the apostle John be talking about? Probably the guy he followed for three, three and a half years, Jesus. Israel gives birth to Jesus, this, this male child. Um, verse 3, the red dragon is Satan. And if we have uh, questions about that, we can go down to verse 9. And it defines the red dragon as Satan, the serpent of the ancient serpent who's in the garden. Um, so that's pretty clear there. So verse 3, the red dragon is Satan. Um, on earth, he's cunning, seven heads. Uh, he's powerful, ten horns. Horn is, in, in the Bible, a symbol of power, like a ram's horn. That's the ram's power, that he can ram somebody else with this, not Jared Goff. Um, that's a football joke for those of you who can answer those things on Jeopardy. And then uh, he possesses authority. Okay, so uh, seven crowns on his head. Okay, and so this is the picture. Satan, in our world, possesses authority. And He's, he's crafty, and he's powerful. Now, John's day, A.D. 95, uh, what, what had happened is that the, the Jews had gone to the Roman government in the late 80s, um, and, uh, and they had said, Christianity is not part of us. They are not a sect or a division or a denomination of the Jewish religion. And this created great problems for the church, and people in the church started dying because Prior to this, Judaism had licensed religion status. And as a licensed religion, licensed by Rome, they weren't required to obey Roman religious rules. And if you had a license, you were part of a licensed religion, you were specifically not required to bow down to the emperor as divine, or to declare him divine, or to give him worship. And so no Jew had to bow down and declare the emperor, Caesar, divine. You know, he didn't have to uh, uh, bow down to him in worship. A Jew literally had a past, and you can look, at, you know, look it up on Wikipedia. They found these archaeologically as well as the, it being in history that the people had these, these uh, uh, tokens that, that showed that they were part of a licensed religion. But Christians couldn't do this anymore starting at the end of the 80s because the Jews had informed the Roman government, no, 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 Christianity is not a part of us. And so for the first five years of the 90s, um, the double zero 90s, um, Christians were losing their lives. Okay, think, you know, uh, Roman Colosseum and that, that kind of thing. Um, and so uh, uh, certainly John's readers knew we don't have the power. The crown is not on our head. The civil crown is not on our head. And there's crafty stuff going on around us because we are the fulfillment of Judaism. We are Old Testament religion done right, understood right. And it's the Jews who are in error they're the ones not following the son of David, our king. We're the ones who are faithful to the Old Testament. 
We're following the line of David. He's our king and we'll lose our lives for him. And the Jews were the ones who rejected God's king, rejected the one anointed by John the Baptist, rejected the one who had ascended on high and been seated by the Father himself at, the, at his own right hand. Okay. Uh, so uh, Satan has that. Uh, verse 4, look back down in your Bibles again. Uh, Satan had other angels or stars uh, in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 1, verse 20. It refers specifically angels or stars. Um, and, and verse 7 speaks of this as well, Satan and his angels who are fighting in heaven. Uh, he caused other angels to fall or to rebel against God uh, with him in days of old. Uh, and then uh, Satan used Herod the Great to attempt to kill Jesus. So what Satan doing is this woman gives birth to Jesus Satan is there ready to catch, ready, ready, ready to kill this child as soon as he comes out. And we see that in Matthew 2 with the decree of Herod the Great, uh, the, the, the one who has the horn, the one who has the crown, the one who's crafty and asks the wise men, where is this in his craft? Where is this king of the Jews that I may go and worship him? See, that's crafty. He doesn't intend to go and worship this boy king Jesus. He intends to kill him, and certainly he sends out his soldiers, and with their power and the authority of the crown, they go to kill Jesus. But Jesus is rescued. He's snatched away to Egypt. He lives his life, and even when he's killed on a cross, he's snatched up to heaven and rescued. And so that's what we see in verse 4. Verse 5, we see Jesus is born. He lives. He's resurrected. He ascends to his heavenly throne. Um, and Jesus' identification here in this verse is the one who rules with an iron scepter. That comes from uh, Psalm 2, verse 9, speaking of the son of David uh, who rules over God's people. He who rules with an iron scepter. Um, uh, uh, Revelation uh, 5 uh, speaks of, of this, Jesus rising, rising up. Revelation 2, 27, you have these listed, or, or you had these listed for you last week. 2, 27 and 19, 15. In Revelation, speak of Jesus as being the one who rules the nations with an iron scepter. This is the child who's born. This is the child who is snatched up, who ascends to heaven and sits at God's right hand. Verse 6, God's people, now the church, is delivered by God to be taken care of in the desert until Jesus' return uh, for 1260 days. And so you can look down there. You see the same thing in verse 14. There in chapter 12, look there at verse 14. See the same thing repeated. We'll talk about this a little bit more. But it's this idea from Moses in Exodus 1 through 17 that where did God's where were God's people protected? And where were they provided when they had been in slavery? When God delivered his people, how did he deliver them? Where did he deliver them to? Where did he provide for them? Where did he protect them? In the desert. He delivers them out of their slavery in Egypt. He brings them into the desert. He provides for them. He cares for them. He gives them water out of a rock. He gives them uh, manna that falls down upon the ground uh, the first six days uh, uh, of the week, uh, each week. Okay. And so this is imagery of Moses, um, that God's people, the church, gets taken care of, um, that this life is a desert. Uh, it's not paradise. It's not our home. It's not the promised land. Life on earth is not the promised land. Life on earth is the desert. But in the midst of the desert, God takes care of us. He gives us the bread of life. He gives us food to eat literally and spiritually. He protects us and provides uh, for us. Um, more on the 1260 days a little bit later. Um, verse 7, look there. In heaven upon Jesus' ascension, uh, John turns his head and Satan and his uh, demons are uh, the angels that have followed him are doing battle with God's good angels, uh, Michael and his and his uh, uh, angel companions there. Verse eight, Satan and the other angels lose the battle. Verse nine, upon losing this post ascension battle, Jesus rises and then this battle occurs in heaven. Satan is kicked out of heaven where he has been accusing dead believers. He's been up there in heaven. He's been accusing dead believers. He shouldn't be here. She shouldn't be here. Don't you know, you know, God, that he did this and she did that? Why are they here? They're not justifiably here. 
And so uh, he's up there, and we see evidence of this as well in the Old Testament in Job verse, chapters 1 and 2, in Zechariah chapter 3, in uh, 1 Kings 22. We see that Satan, as a fallen angel, is still present in heaven and having interaction with uh, God Almighty. But here, he's knocked out of heaven, and he's cast down, and it's a big deal that's made of. And, and what caused Satan to be cast down out of heaven? What's the event? Jesus' ascension. Jesus goes up, Satan comes down, cast down to the earth, or, or in the uh, words of uh, Wayne, hurled down to the earth, right? Okay, then verse 10. Uh, verse 10. Uh, Upon the ascension and Jesus seating his king, uh, Jesus, a new era has begun. And, and look there. Um, what does heaven declare? Uh, well, the um, uh, now have come the salvation. That's the Great Commission. What's happening now since Jesus' ascension? The gospel's going out. Salvation is being spread. It's being dispensed all over the world. Now have come the salvation, the gospel going out all over the world. The power of the Holy Spirit going to people and regenerating them to spiritual life so that they believe. Salvation and power. This is gospel preaching. This is regeneration. This is rebirth, new life, John 3, okay, born from above. And the kingdom of our God. What does Paul say has happened? What does Jesus say has happened? When a person believes, he goes out of the, the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the son he loves. And so this is describing our error. Jesus arises and salvation is proclaimed. Power goes with that proclamation, the power of the Holy Spirit, and people are being delivered out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of of the Son, whom God the Father loves. And so that's what's happening. Now have come salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, who's sitting at the right hand of God. Jesus, with his authority, which he claimed to his disciples in Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission, behold, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. See, it's just saying the same thing. Authority's been given to Jesus. He's been given his seat as king over his church. And with his authority, he gives his marching orders to the church, proclaims salvation, and I'll send power behind you, the power of the Holy Spirit, and he will attend that message of salvation, that message of the gospel, and bring people to life like us, like he did for us. And when he does that, when he brings new life, he will transfer those people out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus. And so Jesus on earth said, the kingdom of heaven is near. And then he takes his seat at the right hand of God and the kingdom of heaven is in full force. And as king in heaven, he tells his soldiers, us, his people, make disciples of all nations, proclaim salvation so that people might, by the power of God, the power of God, be brought into the kingdom of our God. Okay, so that's the, the beginning of verse 10 uh, there. Okay, um, uh, 11, Verse 11, believers on earth today are overcoming their cast down to earth adversary uh, by uh, Jesus' forgiving blood. How they overcome death and Satan? By the blood of Jesus covering them so they don't experience the second death. So when they die, they, they rise to life. And it's, it's uh, Jesus in John 11 at, at, at Lazarus' tomb. Uh, he who believes in me, yea, though he die, yet shall he live. Um, and so, so there's victory by the blood of Jesus. And by our belief in that, holding on to that, um, we, we have that, that victory. Um, verse 12, while heaven rejoices over Satan's expulsion, and they say, great, that guy's not here anymore. That terrible angel who's accusing us day and night, he's not here anymore. We don't have to listen to him anymore. And they rejoice. But then they say, ooh, but woe to you who live on the earth, for the devil has gone down to you. Okay, so 1 Peter 5, uh, 8 and 9 that, that uh, Bob read for us there, that Satan is, is prowling about like a roaring lion on earth, seeking someone to devour. And this is Peter's warning to us as the church. Satan's prowling about on the earth. He's not up in heaven. He's paying attention to us. He's been cast down to the earth. And heaven itself is rejoicing but saying, woe to us because the devil is down here prowling about seeking one of us to devour. 
And uh, so he's, he's going around and he's going furiously around because he knows that his time is short. And that's the last thing we spoke of last, last week. It's like when you're playing a game and you don't know when the end is, um, when the final whistle's going to blow, you play furiously if you're behind because you know you may just have another minute. And so we saw in those passages, Matthew 24, uh, nobody knows when Jesus is going to return. And so that makes things short for us. And so Jesus says, just always be ready and be watchful. For you, my disciples, you don't know the time at which I will return. And so we don't know if we've got another minute. If I'll finish this sermon, I did finish it, so I'm okay. Um, or, or, or if it'll be um, 70 thousand generations after we die we don't know but the fact that we don't know makes the time short and satan doesn't know either he's just furiously going around doing as much damage as he could because he knows when jesus comes the trumpets blow and it's over and his doom his doom comes so now verse 13 so back to your outline here and please keep your bibles open too so you can follow along uh, uh here and with this um verse 13 Again, the woman, so a lot of things repeat here in this, um, here in this passage. And, and when things repeat, we don't say, ah, this is something new and different. No, we say, no, John is still continuing to speak about the same things that he's speaking about. So verse 13, the woman is the people of God. That's your blank. The church in our era. Okay, so we saw that in verses 1 and 2. In verses 4 and 5, this is the, the, the true Israel. Uh, that, that follows that follows God, um, uh, the the uh, post ascension uh, church there, okay. And then uh, Revelation twelve one there we can see that woman with twelve stars in her head. She's pregnant. She gives birth. Uh, she gives birth to the son. Verses four and five, and, and that's that's who we follow. We follow him. Uh, thus, verse 13 here says, the dragon pursued the woman who had given, given birth to the male child. He pursues God's people. Okay. Uh, your B there, uh, second part of this verse, or second thing to say about verse 13. Uh, know that Satan pursues God's people, uh, or the woman, through a couple of things. False teaching. And uh, John had addressed a bunch of that in chapters 2 and 3 with his letters to the seven churches in modern-day Turkey, uh, ancient-day Asia. Okay, he pursues God's people through false teaching and through wolves uh, within the church. So two things within the church, false teachers and wolves, and sometimes there's overlap of those two things, not always. Um, that's chapters 2 and 3. And through persecution by individuals, uh, groups, uh, back then, they had trade guilds where you had to bow down to Caesar to be a part of the trade guild. And if you weren't a part of the trade guild, you couldn't do business. Uh, and so various things, governments of the world are, are, are all lined up. Things outside, that's your blank, things outside the church are also uh, part of uh, Satan's um, scheming against the church. So Satan's working inside the church with false teachers and wolves. He's working outside the church with persecution coming from the outside. Uh, governments and trade guilds and all those uh, kind of things uh, outside the church. And, and so Paul had declared about 40 years earlier in 2 Timothy 3.12, and indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so we're not saying anything different here. Um, Satan persecutes the church, and he works any way he can uh, to get at us. To, he's seeking someone to devour. Uh, verse 14, look there. The church is delivered, protected, and provided for in this era. As Moses' people were uh, delivered and protected and provided for in the desert. That's your blank, in the desert. Uh, so verse 6 had spoken of this already. Um, we looked at verse 6 there, and verse 6 uh, says that woman fled into the desert to a place prepared to her by God so where she might be taken care of for 1,200 for 1260 days. So this is the place of God's deliverance, the desert. And it's figuratively spoken of here. We don't live in a desert, uh, but this is the place, this is communicating 
God will take care of us, the church, like he took care of the people under Moses. And even though the circumstances around us are not that, uh, don't, don't look that great, um, desert, nonetheless, in the midst of the desert, he will provide for us. Um, uh, interesting thing there, it says the woman is given two wings of an eagle for her protection. This is language again from the days of Moses. Uh, before God gives the Ten Commandments, he says he carried his people with eagle's wings out of Egypt. Exodus 19, 1 through 4. Uh, Deuteronomy 32 says the same thing. It makes this reference to eagle's wings and how God is hovering over his people, eagle's wings to protect them, to provide for them, to deliver them. And so that's the case. That's the case for us uh, today. And, and, and uh, God uses through John this imagery of, of the desert that was protection uh, for God's people from Egypt and the harm he would do from them and his provision uh, for them and how he carried uh, and carries today the church uh, on eagle's wings. A uh, second thing with uh, verse 14 here in your B point there. That protection uh, is that the church continues to exist. Yeah, that's bare level protection. Uh, that the church continues to exist. And that Christians are either spared from martyrdom, physical death by persecution, Individuals are either spared from physical death by persecution or are simply protected in their deaths by physical persecution. So sometimes God's people, John's day, our day, are protected from death for our faith. And we continue, we're able to continue living on life like Paul was so many times when his life was threatened. But sometimes... We lose our lives for the gospel, not so much in this country now, but in other countries on the earth today, people are losing their lives. Uh, certainly in John's day, people were losing their lives. But the message is this, even in that, even in death, God protects us. He just Death is just entrance into seeing Jesus and being with him in heaven, utterly protected not cast down to hell, protected. So we see this in, in uh, 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 an assurance of this in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation with the fifth seal in, in verses 9 through 11 there. John is given this vision of heaven, and what does he see there? The dead souls of those who have been martyred already in those first five years and in the, uh, the years before that. Anybody who had been killed for their faith. John sees them there around the throne of Jesus in heaven, and they're uh, saying to Jesus there, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood? And so here's the assurance. God is taking care of his people, even those whose blood has been spilled because they were a Christian, because they were faced with the choice of give up your faith in Jesus, bow down to the emperor and declare him divine, declare your allegiance to him as your God, or die those who said, well, then I'll die. Jesus is my God. That God protects them. And he's delivered them. Uh, he delivered them to heaven. And, and so Ephesians 1.20 that Bob read for us this morning in our declaration of the gospel. God raised Jesus from the dead, seated him as his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. See the Rome reference there? far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, Caesar, whatever, not only in the present age, those titles, titles of civil officials in our age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. So even though Satan's realm is the realm of this earth, the kingdom of darkness, Jesus is reigning in heaven above for our sake, for the church, to protect us and to provide for us, even in our deaths, for our faith. 
So again, as Jesus said in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Even though he's cast out into the desert in death, I provide for him bread and water and he lives and he's sustained. Third thing, C in, in uh, verse 14 still. The time between Jesus' ascension and his return is named symbolically as a short one in Scripture. And um, we see this in, in verse 12. Satan knows that his time is short. Okay, So he names this uh, time symbolically as a short one in Scripture with three synonyms for the same period of time of three and a half years. So that's your first blank. So the time period is three and a half years. And he gives us three synonyms for this, which if we do math, we can find out are just other ways of saying three and a half uh, years. That is 1,260 days. Okay, so if you add up 1,260, that's three days, that's three and a half years. That's how many days are in three and a half years. Um, and it's referred to 1,260 days in Revelation 11, 3 and 12, 6. Then he also refers to this period of three and a half years as 42 months. Okay, 36 divided by 12 is three years, plus six is 42, three and a half years, 42 months. And God refers to this, remember, God uses synonyms. All right, God uses synonyms, that's a good interpretive principle for you, okay? You can say God, and you can say the Lord, and it's the same person, okay? Uh, and so God uses synonyms. He says 1,260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, or he uses this phrase time, times, and half a time. Time, times, and half a time. Each time is a year. See that time? That's one. Times, that's two. And half a time, three, three and a half. Danny uses that um, in uh, verse 14 here. And then Daniel 7, uh, 23 through 27 there. And Daniel 7 and 9 that uh, Bob read for us tell us that this time, times, and half a time period is that period of time between when Jesus is anointed and he brings in his kingdom and when the civil authorities of this world come to an end. That's, that's what Daniel calls time, times, and half a time. The period between the anointing of the great king for God's people and the end of all earthly governments that are lined up against his people, oppressing them with their ten horns and seven crowns. So Daniel sets that, and, and as God uh, uh, pronounces that to Daniel in chapter 7 and, and chapter 9, and uh, perhaps we'll do uh, that in Sunday school. If you want to hear more about that, we'll do, spend the first half of Sunday school next week uh, parsing that out and kind of showing you Daniel 9 and how that relates to this and chapter 7. And so if you want to just come for that, um, uh, or if you want to come for that next at the beginning of next week's Sunday school, uh, you may. Um, to, to follow along in Daniel 9 and how that works out there. But uh, Daniel 7 and Daniel 9 tell us that this period, this domination of the world government, not run by God's people and that oppresses God's people, is symbolically the last three and a half weeks of this, or the last, the last uh, uh, half week, the last three and a half days of these 70 weeks of Daniel. Okay, and so that's, that's Daniel 9. If you want to see that parsed out, come come to Sunday school and you'll see that and and you'll say duh it's 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 really pretty simple but because of what we've been taught we've got all these errant ideas in our head so it's harder to see but once you see it you'll say duh that makes sense okay so uh, this uh, Daniel 9 this this period we're in uh, according to Daniel is this last half of the last week last half of the 70th, 70th week this time between Jesus' anointing and Jesus' return, when he does away with all the oppression on the earth against his people. So the meaning of the three and a half years is tribulation or hardship for God's people. Uh, when there was no uh, rain in the days of Elijah under the wicked king Ahab. So what's James tell us? James 5, 17, 18. <coughs> No rain for three and a half years. 
Can you imagine that if you're an agricultural society and you don't have refrigerators? Right? No rain for th no crops for three and a half years. Period of great hardship. And, and that's the that's the, the symbolism uh, given here uh, by God. So D in your outline there. Three and a half years is Bible speak for a period of hardship for God's people. That's James 5, 17 and 18. Um, three and a half years was that period of no rain uh, under under uh, Elijah, which is the, uh, you can read about in 1 Kings 17 and 18. So let me summarize this. Um, from the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem in AD 70, Jesus' ascension, all these events of the first century, the church has been symbolically in this last three and a half period. It's a period between the anointing of the king and the return of the king. And it's a period of great hardship. It's a three and a half, it's a Bible three and a half. It's a time of tribulation. It's a time of hardship. It's a time of no rain and famine and that kind of thing. And you can read about that in Revelation 6 as to how that three and a half years spills out. There are wars, there's famine, there's disease, there's death, there's persecution, all kinds of stuff going on in this period of time. Okay, and then E. Um, the idea with the time frame of three and a half years is that Jesus could return at any time, but nobody knows when. And that's what Jesus communicates to us in Matthew 24. Uh, so if you don't know when something is going to return, if you're doing a game where there's a timer going, you know, we have a game called Perfection. Anyone know that game, Perfection? You set the timer and you push the, the thing down and you got to put all these shapes in the right spaces, you know, that fit the shapes. And, and this timer's going, and at the end of the timer, the, the board pops up. There's a spring and it pops up and all the pieces go all over the place. If you can't see that timer... You don't know how much time you have left and you're nervous and you're working hard because time is short. And that's the idea. That's the idea here. And that's why God uses this time frame of three and a half, three and a half years. Okay, now verse 15. Look at verse 15. Satan seeking the harm of the church is spoken of as a torrential river. And this brings in imagery of the flood of Noah. That's your blank. The flood of Noah and the Red Sea. Uh, both of which looked pretty intimidating for God's people and were potential threats for God's people. Imagine being with Moses, right? And Moses parts the water. That's pretty cool. But it's like, come follow me in through the Red Sea. And you've got sea to your right and the left. You're like, right? Just walking out in it. And then you get out in the middle and you're like, oh, no. Man, if this just comes down, I'm, I'm toast like the, like the Egyptian army was. Okay? But, but recognize that this is not everything. You know, imagine if you'd never seen that before. We've seen it because we know um, Charlton Heston. So if we saw it, we'd say, no problem, because we know the end of the story. But they had never seen something like that, like you and I have never seen something like that really in life. And so that was a very threatening thing. What if, what if God changes his mind? Or what if we've, uh, um, what if God's tired of us bickering with Moses and this is his way of putting an end to us? Um, that's pretty threatening. Or, or the days of Noah. The, 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 it's the water that's God's judgment. Now, like, gratefully for God's people under Moses, God's judgment of water came upon Pharaoh and his army. But in Noah's day, God's judgment came in the form of, of water uh, drowning, you know, all those who who did not think they needed salvation from God. Noah and his sons and the, their their wives thought they needed salvation from God, so they stopped, stepped on the ark. Nobody else did. Um, and so this is this is the imagery here. How does Satan Satan work? How does Satan destroy people? This this kind of thing. Um, so that's Genesis six through nine, Noah and Exodus fourteen, the Red Sea, verse sixteen. Verse 16, um, as God had protected his people from the flood and the Red Sea in those days, those Old Testament days, God protects the church from Satan's harm today. That's the message there. God's protecting his people. So 
here in this passage, we see, yes, the river is, is coming. And oftentimes in our lives, things look very threatening. That's the, that's what the symbolism means there. It's a torrential river that's coming to, to, to wipe us out, like in Superman, right? When the Hoover Dam gets, you know, uh, 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 it's, it crumbles and, and the water is coming through there. Um, it's intimidating. Uh, but we're to know that God protects his people and he opens the earth and symbolically, he opens the earth and swallows up and keeps us safe in the persecution. So we've got dead, desert imagery of being kept safe in the persecution. Now we have imagery of, of he keeps us safe from this torrential river or this, this uh, um, agent of judgment, uh, this r river that's coming to do, us, to do us harm. And then verse 17, our last uh, verse here. The church today is the offspring. The church today is the offspring of the first believers in Jesus, and Satan makes war against us too. See that there in verse 17? Um, the first century, the ch this first century church is spoken of in Scripture as the first fruits. Uh, in a couple of places, uh, in both James one eighteen and James one eighteen and Revelation uh, fourteen four, speak of the churches in the first century as the first fruits. Okay, and, and so that's the idea that there's a whole harvest that Jesus is bringing in. A harvest of people that he's bringing into his kingdom. And that's a lot of his parables are harvest parables. And the reaping at the end of harvest time is final judgment in those parables. But here it speaks of the church in the first century being first fruits of that harvest. The first fruits were the, the first grapes that were ripe that you could pick. Or I was a, a kid, we had an apple orchard. The first apples, you know, certain kinds of apple trees were were ripe before the other ones. These were the first fruits. And the church in the first century, those who believed in the first century, were the first fruits of the entire harvest that Jesus was going to, to bring in to himself before, before he returned. And so we're the offspring of these, of these first fruits. We, the church today, um, we who are um, the uh, ones who have been spiritually born, who have been the fruit of the faithfulness of those in the, the first century uh, church. So note, as we've been through these verses now, um, as we've looked at each verse in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 12, we have not said anything new that hasn't been said in other parts of Scripture. Okay, We're just saying, how, what, where, do things in, uh, where do other things in Scripture speak in these ways? What does the New Testament tell us already? Yeah, it tells us about kingdom transfer. It tells us about the spirit, bringing about spiritual life. It tells us that Satan is roaring about, prowling about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We're interpreting the book of Revelation. We're interpreting Revelation 12 in accordance with things that are taught clearly in other parts of Scripture. And so that's what we read in our, our uh, declaration of, of what we believe, our third part there. Where do we look for aid when one part of the scriptures is less than clear to us? It's the front of your first page. The infallible guide to the interpretation of scripture is the scriptures themselves. So we always want to, when we say, this verse means A, we want to look and say, is there anywhere else in scripture that teaches A? And the answer should be yes. And if the answer is no, we should be really suspect of our interpretation. And so what we're seeing here is we go through Revelation 12. We're not talking about anything different. Jesus was born. We know that elsewhere. Jesus was snatched up to heaven. We know that elsewhere. Jesus was seated at the right hand of God. We know that elsewhere. Satan persecutes the church. We know that from other parts of Scripture as well. Jesus comes out of Israel. Born of Mary, an Israelite, we know that from other parts of Scripture. Uh, Satan has fallen, and he has angels fallen with him. We've read about that in the Garden of Eden. We knew that. And so all these, all these things that we're saying are things that are taught elsewhere, and so we know we're, sa we're safely interpreting. We're not coming up with some uh, new doctrine that doesn't fit uh, with the rest of Scripture. And that's something we always that's something we always want to do. Um, so conclusion, conclusion for you. 
Revelation as a whole is a book that helps you understand the great battle between Satan and Jesus from Jesus' birth and ascension to his return. And then chapter 12. Chapter 12 tells you that Jesus was born. Tells you that he was rescued from death. Even though his, his, there was a hit called out on him. It tells us that he was ascended to his heavenly throne. It tells us that from his heavenly throne, he now rules. He rules from there over his earthly people. And as he rules from the right hand of God, where he was snatched up and he's ascended and he's now ruling, as he's ruling, what's he doing with his rulership? He's, here's your blank, protecting. He's protecting us, his church, from the internal and external strife that Satan brings against the church until Jesus returns. Let's pray.